Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Todd Cohen, your moderator for today's State of the Net panel on AI and the Arts, Redefining Creativity in the Digital Age. We will be taking a critical look at the burgeoning impact of artificial intelligence on the creative industries, from literature, music, the fine arts, modeling, photography, acting, screenwriting, and comedy. The advent of powerful large language models or foundation models have jarred policymakers in Washington and globally who may have believed that only rote tasks would be automated by AI. As generative AI tools begin to create content with increasing sophistication, authors, musicians, filmmakers, and artists of all types are grappling how these new technologies are having, are what the new technologies will mean on their crafts and livelihoods. Our panel will discuss some of the policy implications of AI in the creative industries. I also want to disclose a few things about myself before we begin. I'm serving on the, as a moderator on the panel as a longtime board member of the Internet Education Foundation. I'm also an attorney with Steptoe, helping in creating something called the AI Coalition for Data Integrity, which when we go public later this month, will advocate on behalf of entities and individuals whose data in all forms and types is being exploited by generative AI companies without disclosure, credit, or remuneration. But for the purposes of this panel, I will be serving as a moderator and not advocating on behalf of any of my clients or their interests, and I will be also a sad 49ers fan as well. <laughs> With that, um, let me begin by introducing our panelists today. First, Ash Khan Kazarian. Kazarian is a tech policy, tech policy expert. She manages and develops policy projects on free speech, content moderation, surveillance reform, and the intersection of constitutional rights and technology. Currently, she is a senior fellow of free speech and peace at Stand Together. Prior to that, she was a content policy manager on the content regulation team at Meta, covering North and Latin America, and was also its policy lead on Section 230. Before that, she was the Director of Civil Liberties at Tech Freedom. Um, she's also a proud supporter of the New England Patriots and Broadway musical enthusiast. Next is Hodon uh, Omar, who's a senior analyst focusing on AI policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation Center for Data Innovation. Previously, she worked as a senior consultant with Deloitte on technology and risk management in London and as an economist in Berlin for the Interplanetary Database. She worked for the IDP, the Interplanetary Database on a pricing model for the indefinite storage of data on the blockchain. She has an MA in economics and mathematics from the University of Edinburgh. Third is Stan Adams. Stan is the lead public policy specialist for the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization that supports Wikipedia and other volunteer-run projects focused on free access to knowledge. Prior to his role at the foundation, Mr. Adams served as general counsel to U.S. Senator John Ossoff, and before that as a policy expert for the Center for Democracy and Technology. While at CDT, Stan worked to promote access to information, permissionless innovation, and secure non-discriminatory communications technologies. He also advocated for copyright and trade policies that balance the interests of copyrights and users while preserving the ability of individual people to create, contribute, and share experiences and expressions online. Next, Eileen Skyers. Eileen is an artist, writer, and curator. Her moving image work has been exhibited globally, and her first book, Vanishing Acts, was published in 2015. She is a creative director at Housing, an art space dedicated to artists of color in New York. She holds a BA in philosophy, a BFA in studio art, and an MA in critical studies. And at the end of December, she wrote in Freeze a story on new, perspective, new perspectives for decentralized art. And finally, Ben Scheffner. Ben is the Senior Vice President and Associate General Counsel of Law and Policy at the Motion Picture Association, where he specializes in copyright, First Amendment, and other legal policy issues of importance to the MBA, MPA's member studios. Prior to joining the MPA in 2011, Ben held in-house legal positions at NBC Universal and 20th Century Fox. And prior to attending law school, 
Ben worked as a political reporter in Washington, D.C. for both the Cook Political Report and the Roll Call newspaper. Without further ado, let me um, really welcome all the panelists and start with the first question. And what I'd ask is everybody just give, um, take some time to, to really talk about what, how can we generate content AI, content indistinguishable from human created works and how should the intellectual property laws evolve in this space? Should they be focused on protecting the rights of authors, musicians, and artists, and then also trying to foster innovation? Please, let's start with Ash. You like for like a, like a five books question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, my, if a takeaway from what I say is that don't trust anyone who tells you they know the answer to this. Uh, run far, far away from them. Uh, let that be it. I would say that the intellectual property laws, uh, depending on the country of where we are situated, um, I think it's important to look at the international perspective, at the US, EU, UK has their own thing going on, are very different. And we haven't seen courts really continue to adapt. And that's where I urge everyone to actually see, especially in the United States with the legal system we have in place, how about we like see how this unfolds before we make all the judgments? Because there's a lot of incentives and trade-offs, some of which we're unaware. We have artists here who can actually tell us their perspective. You know, we have you representing the industry and like there's gonna be so many different checks and balances we need to have in place and the balance is going to be extremely important here. Um, and I feel like it's one of those uh, situations where you're time trying to um, stop like a ticking bomb and you're like, which cord do I cut, cut, right? But the thing is, and I might be very optimistic here, but I don't think there's going to be an explosion. We don't need to be deciding how do we do this right now. We need to be following the pattern of what's going on. Um, and, you know, there is a new story about something every week, you know, AI this, AI that. Um, the biggest difference between AI tools uh, and what we're, we've seen even five years ago is the scale of them versus the actual, you know, we still, Photoshop has existed since I was a teenager, not to date myself. Um, so my, my answer would be, I don't know how intellectual property laws should react. Maybe you do. I think you should, you should go next, next after me. Um, but I would urge for people to, A, distinguish AI from this magical thing behind the curtain, and B, to slow down um, on making judgments on how we should actually deal with it be, until we have see, see how the cards fall. What do you think? How um, intellectual property law should work? So I actually uh, agree with, with virtually everything that I just heard. Um, maybe coming at it from a little bit different perspective. Um, I'll just say this. So, um, again, I work at the Motion Picture Association and represent the, the big movie studios. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, in rooms with colleagues from uh, other parts of the entertainment industry, other uh, copyright owners and creators. And I hear a lot of, uh, of dread and fear. Um, people throw around terms like existential threat a lot. And frankly, we in the motion picture and television industries do not feel that AI presents um, an existential threat. We don't approach the, uh, the developments that we've seen um, since late 2022 with uh, the rise of ChatGPT and stable diffusion and other generative AI systems. Uh, we don't view those as, as threats. Um, our industry has been around for a long time, over a century, um, but one constant has been change. There's been new technological developments starting in the 1920s, um, the introduction of sound and the introdu uh, introduction of color, uh, television, the VCR, the internet, and many others along the way. And um, there's always nervousness about new technological developments. Um, sometimes they're implemented in ways that don't respect the rights of copyright owners. And every once in a while, uh, the law actually needs to be updated and changed to address these new threats. Uh, but what I would say about the, these new developments that we've seen over the last uh, several years um, is that we're watching them very closely, um, that uh, 
we don't think that Congress or policymakers should jump to conclusions about what needs to be done quite yet. We do have this, you know, fairly this common law system here in the U.S. where uh, issues tend to, you know, the percolate, percolate from the lower courts on up, uh, applying case law developed in other factual context to this new um, to these new developments. Um, we're hopeful and, and, and confident so far that existing law is kind of up to the task of dealing with these new factual developments, but we don't know for sure. Um, and we're going to be watching that closely over the next uh, several years as things develop. Stan. <clears throat> I'll just chime in on the don't believe the hype chain here. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, one, Wikipedia content is slightly different from the sort of art that you create and the, the art that, uh, you know, Motion Picture Association artists are, are working on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was saying, we're, you know, the content that is on Wikipedia is slightly different than... Uh, that represented by my co-panelists here. Um, but we've also been sort of cast as, you know, the next thing to fall to, to chat GPT, right? I think there was some relatively high coverage, high, high profile news coverage of this a year or so ago or last, last summer, um, talking about just the ways that people access information may change, right? People are going to start asking chat GPT for answers to their questions rather than going to Wikipedia. Um, Despite the hype there, we also don't think that's true. Um, largely because ChatGPT can't back up anything that it says, right? It, it just says what it says. It doesn't say, here's how I know this is right. Um, compared to all the content on Wikipedia is, you know, cited to verifiable authoritative sources that let you then go see, like, is this correct or not, right? And so I just, uh, not to, not to, belabor the point, but I, I second Ash's comments that, like, we don't need to rush to do things here, and, and second Ben's comments that, like, these problems, if they are problems, will be more easy to articulate and identify as we see things develop a little bit. Eileen, do you see things coming to an end? <laughs> um, not necessarily. I think I would agree with my co-panelists in thinking that... Um, before policymakers sort of plunge headfirst into overregulating, um, they need to pay attention to what artists are actually doing and establish at first, you know, some basic understanding of how fast this is moving, what creative applications there are, and what artists' needs actually are. Um, if you look to artists like Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst. Um, they are actually working on something called spawning, which is a system that allows artists to um, input their own imagery, find out if models have been trained on it, and then opt out of being used in future models. So rather than creating like blanket overgeneralizing um, sort of policies and frameworks, I think that systems can be put into place that give artists agency over their own works and whether or not they want them to be used. If I could just add on, I think as we talk about what policymakers should and shouldn't do, it's also worth, um, I think, remembering what the tools that they have um, can do. I mean, ultimately, the way I think about this is to kind of ground the conversation in um, the role of, of copyright regimes, which are ultimately an economic tool. Um, you know, can we uh, or, sh you know, we should be providing content creators with economic rights so that they are induced and rewarded to uh, continue to create um, novel works that, um, you know, spur continued innovation and, like, overall societal benefits. Um, and so that is also the lens through which we should be evaluating um, changes to copyright regimes. Do they sp continue to spur innovation? Um, and I, I just want to add that. Uh, well, let me, let me push back on that. So the European model of moral rights is not an economic for, it's not an economic model for copyright. So there are different interests that in many copyright regimes that aren't strictly fine, that aren't strictly economic. And I think that's one of the hard parts of, of trying to set policy in the area is it's, it is, I find, much easier to set economic policy than it is to set um, policies that are trying to um, incentivize other interests. Is there a way, um, 
Do you see that? I, I see this coming in the EU AI Act. And has anyone had a, taken a look at, at the implications of the disclosures and, and some of the rights that they're, they're inserting into the EU AI Act? Sure, I can take that on a, a little bit. So one of the issues that has um, been on the table in terms of um, potential new regulations for AI is um, transparency or disclosure obligations, both on the input side. That's, um, you know, if, you're, if you are an AI developer and you are training your model um, on copyrighted works, should you have to, um, should there be an affirmative obligation to disclose what you're doing, um, which works you're, you're using for training purposes? And then also on the output side, should you be, if you're using an AI system to generate something new, should you be required when you sort of put that um, out into the wild to disclose that you've been using uh, uh, AI or used AI as a tool in, in your creativity. Um, and um, I think the thing that I would emphasize as policymakers are looking at these questions is, is the need for nuance. Um, it's not whether transparency or disclosure is a good thing or a bad thing, should be required, shouldn't be required, but rather when should it be required, under what circumstances. So we at the MPA generally think um, that it is, it is a good thing. Um, if you are going to be just uh, training your model on other uh, on, on copyrighted works to which you don't have permission, um, then you should be disclosing that so that the copyright owner can know about that. Um, but you shouldn't have to do it, for example, if you're using, if you're training a model on your own works that you already own or that you've licensed for that purpose. There's no reason that you should be required to disclose that kind of information to the public. On the output side, um, again, it might seem like a good idea in the abstract. Of course, everyone should have to disclose if they're using AI to create something new. Well, um, this is where this, this idea of like risk-based re um, regulation, I think, is really important. We're talking about things like national security or maybe a political campaign ad. You know what? It's probably a good idea that we know if, if AI is being used to create something that, that new that didn't really happen in real life. But when you're uh, making a new movie and there are uh, aliens attacking Paris, and you're using CGI, which employs AI tools to make the Eiffel Tower explode. Well, under some of the um, original versions, the original drafts of the AI Act, you were going to have to put a label on the screen saying AI was used. This wasn't really the, uh, the Eiffel Tower exploding. This was an, just an AI version. And that's obviously silly. And um, my colleagues in, uh, in Brussels um, spent a lot of time and energy lobbying to make sure that those disclosure obligations on the output side now do not uh, apply to fictional works of entertainment. So you're not going to have to see a big label when the Eiffel Tower explodes. It's that kind of thing. I think that's Edge of Tomorrow, right? With Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt when aliens are attacking Paris. That's a great movie, by the way. Um, what you were saying really triggered some things for me. Um, First of all, I feel like the whole point of America was not following what Europe does. Uh, <laughs> if I can <laughs> just, I'm on this like one man crusade um, against European way of life. Um, but but you you know you you even said it yourself. Your your colleagues in Brussels are lobbying hard, and I'm sure doing a good job. Uh, but they're also kind of like the incumbents, right? Who are capturing this market. And to go back to like a broken record to the, you know, the, the dot-com boom and the development of social media platforms. That was the difference between what the EU laws were and what U.S. legal system was. And the outcome was that U.S. was the innovation space where much more innovation developed and still is. These companies are here versus EU being kind of there. Um, so that's my kind of knee-jerk reaction um, I mean, we should all know what Europeans are doing. Uh, most of them are running for office while they're doing it, um, posting every day about selfies from sessions of, we're going to regulate AI. And I understand the current companies who are in this business having to engage and I'm sure making whatever ideas they have better. Um, but yes, we, we are not in the space like EU is, and I think that's that's going to be the next great experiment to see if this if this theory I have that if we if we just don't follow the European example, we might end up in a better place. So, Ash, you're you're saying you believe that European regulatory um, imposition 
decreased innovation and made U.S. companies successful? Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, I feel like we're all, as a panelist, are agreeing a lot, so let me just, like, <laughs> throw something out there. Um, an artist named Grimes, I don't know if any of you have listened to their music, uh, when the AI kind of boom a year and a half ago just started, first came out and said, everyone use my music, uh, feel free to put it in generative AI models and um, create your own thing, do whatever you want with it. I'm giving you you know, permission to do that. An exact week later, they came back and said, um, so guys, how about we go 50-50 and I get 50% of the profit you get from using my music. Mm-hmm. And then a week later, Grimes came back and said, actually, my lawyers uh, just advised me to say, please stop using my music for mm-hmm. creation for now. Sorry, we're just going to have to like stop right now. And this is the like fascinating part of this, right? Um, and, and you were saying artists, you, like, artists are working with some of these companies. There will always be, you know, path faith operators that are going to still try and work go, around. But, yeah, work around, but we're never going to, like, get rid of bad people, like, as just a concept. Um, but, but I guess to, to kind of make the panel less agreeable with each other, <laughs> um, what, is it, what do other people think about... The, the balance of fair use and creating new art off of old art um, and the balance that exists there and who should own the copyright. Because if you look at it, there can be, I mean, many different scenarios, right? And the courts can maybe look at each case specifically, but I think our courts, of course, would be overwhelmed if we let them, like, handle all this litigation that's going to come down. Um, it can be the copyright holder of the original artwork that gets the copyright, right, to the... Uh, whatever was created with AI tools, it can be, I guess it can be the company like OpenAI or any other company that provided the software here. It can go into public domain, which I guess we never said public domain yet. If something is created with AI tools, um, maybe it's not protected and it's for everyone to use. So I'm just asking the (laughs) panel to, like, disagree on this. I actually want to come back to disclosure in a minute, but I'll take the fair use bait briefly um, and say what we said to the Copyright Office without actually taking a position on this. Um, Tricky tricky law you're writing here. Um, It's it's important to think about how you frame the question of what the use is when you're analyzing fair use. And various courts may take different approaches to what that use is. I think it's more likely to be deemed fair if you classify the use as creating a model that just reflects relationships between different pieces of language tokens, right? That seems very transformative and not commercial. But if you frame the use as creating a tool to create new copies of copyrighted works, that's a very different sort of use case, right? And so I think, I don't know which path courts may adopt, but I think whichever trend becomes dominant may really impact how, how fair use is analyzed down the road. Um, but I want to come back to, to uh, Todd's question about disclosure and transparency. Wikimedia Foundation and all Wikipedia projects are like as transparent as they can get, right? Like everything is open source and everything is public facing. So we of course support transparency, but I question what the value of disclosing the massive corpus of inputs into a large language model does either sort of for copyright incentives or for the individual copyright holders other than to perhaps enable uh, litigation, right? And I also <laughs> question the, like, what is the purpose of labeling, which the, the AI Act, I don't, I'm not sure if it actually, where they landed on that, how narrow it was, but in a world where lots of content will ultimately have a, this is synthetic or part of the synthetic label on it, that label becomes meaningless for all of us pretty quickly, right? And so I think we may need a different kind of labeling system than uh, this might have been created by a machine. Uh, so I, I would like other panelists' thoughts on that too. Yeah, just on, on that point, it's actually a point that I heard um, lawyers at studios make is, you know, today we're calling this AI. Um, next year, we might just be calling it technology because the, the AI tools... Uh, I mean, one thing that I like to emphasize is that the use of AI is actually not very new at, at, um, 
among our members, um, the, the major movie studios. They've been using AI for a long time. It hasn't been the, the generative AI, which really just came on the scene within the last year and a half or so. But for 20, 30 years, they've been using software tools that incorporate machine learning to one extent or the other. And as, as one of my colleagues at the studios likes to call it, this is like the boring part of my talk. Um, the boring uses of AI that the studios have been using for a long time. These are generally in the post-production process. So after you've already shot the movie and you're doing all your fancy things with special effects and kind of making the movie, um, you know, uh, getting it into shape to actually be shown to an audience, things like color correction, de-blurring, aging and de-aging an actor, uh, removing defects from the screen. It could be even things, removing a little defect. Uh, if I have a, a pimple on my forehead when they shot it, they can remove that in post. Um, a lot of that is done through machine learning, where you, um, uh, a very specialized visual effects artist may make the changes in one scene and maybe the next scene, and the AI tool, the AI editing tool, learns from what they've done and then essentially applies those changes that you've made to each individual scene. You used to have to be done kind of by, literally by hand. Then um, the next stage of the evolution was, you know, using computer systems, but still by hand. Now it can be done through machine learning. And as we like to say, it, it leaves the creative people more time to be creative. It takes the kind of rote and routine aspects of their job, automates it, so again, they can, they can concentrate on the, the more creative and artistic aspects of, of their job. On, on this point about inputs and outputs as well, I think there's a, uh, a difference between the types of models and how they work. Because if, if you have a sort of small model that is trained on a identifiable set of content, um, the relationship between each piece of content and the output of that model might be easier to, to kind of understand. Uh, whereas if you have these kind of large language models, the impact of any particular piece of content as an input on the output of those models is, is completely different. And so the copyright regimes that we consider um, have to really think about that, um, and especially in these conversations around disclosure and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I would, I would just add, I mean, this, this fair use question, I mean, I think the, the debate um, has gotten very polarized over the last year and a half that it's really been taking place about this whole training issue. And in one camp are, frankly, mo I'd say put most of the entertainment industry, I wouldn't necessarily put us in, the, in that camp, um, saying you must get permission to use my work to train an AI system, end of story, full stop. On the other hand, at uh, the other end of the spectrum, you have the AI companies that say it's all fair use. Um, it's just, it's all the stuff going on in the background, I'm not making a full copy that's going to be displayed to the public, therefore it's transformative and it's fair use. And um, I would say we're somewhere um, in the middle. Um, and that's not just, it's not just based on kind of not wanting to, to lock ourselves into a position up front, but it's really about the way that fair use works here in the U.S. And the, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said this multiple times, that, it, that in the world of fair use, there are no bright line rules. So you have to look at it case by case. And just to, to sort of give maybe a little bit more stark examples of the kind of thing that, that, um, that Stan and others have mentioned is take two scenarios. One is you have a general purpose AI system that is trained on billions and billions of words. And you can put in an, a query and get any sort of output that you want. Um, put that on, on put, that's example A, or hypothetical A. Hypothetical B is you have a... Um, an AI system that is specifically trained, and this is an example we used in our filing with the Copyright Office last fall, specifically trained on all of the James Bond movies, okay? Um, and then it outputs um, a new spy movie. It's not a James Bond movie. You keep, there's no recognizable elements directly from any of the James Bond movies, uh, but it learned what, it, what, what a good spy movie is like, and then it outputs a new spy movie that might compete with new James Bond movies that come out. Now, courts are gonna look at those differently. They're gonna look at, well, what is the, what is the, the, how does that harm the market value if you are one of 10 billion pieces of content in this general purpose system versus, oh, you're just one of 30 in this system that actually outputs something that is gonna compete with one of the original. Courts are, that, that's, that's what fair use does. It looks at those differently. And, and the courts may come to, to different answers. Um, uh, until there's some stability um, 
uh, down the road, probably years down the road. Aileen, um, Aileen, do you have any thoughts on, on this about, especially as uh, the copyright litigation model that will follow in the U.S. is automatically set up more for those who have deeper pockets to even begin the process of going down the copyright litigation path. How do you think that will affect? Um, well, artists? artists will be at a disadvantage automatically. Um, that's an interesting point you bring up about the James Bond <laughs> um, films. I think that um, one thing that I tend to stress when in conversations about art made with AI, and this probably um, is the case for films and other types of media as well, is that it's actually much harder to use these tools to create something original or more with more ingenuity. I think it's becoming really obvious really quickly when things are um, more sort of replicable forms of media that are trained on pre-existing forms of media. So when it comes to value of art, there are two kind of philosophies around it, right? There is art that you value that you've created and you see value in it and it's value that those who are consuming art see in it. I, I was wondering for you as an artist, you know, to, it's so hard to be an artist in a capitalist system to begin with. Not that it's easier to be an artist in a communist, let me be clear. <laughs> um, but... Um, What's kind of a balance there? Because, I mean, I get upset if someone steals my joke. Uh, like, w w what's the balance there? Because, obviously, you know, fair use and art is reproduction, and, you know, we've had all the Andy Warhol cases in the world. Um, kind of where's the... How do you see that? It's a really interesting question. I think we were just sharing a note right before our conversation about how, um, in today's day and age... Um, to some degree, it's almost as if all art is some form of remix culture, just because we are all synthesizing so many images um, and so much media on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the way I consider it from my own view is that I myself as an artist, it, I'm a little bit of a filter for all of my experiences and things like that. So I don't feel necessarily like cheated by a system where someone may gain inspiration or replicate some portion of my work. What's fascinating is also you were saying, Sarah Silverman, I think, had a failed lawsuit somewhat recently over that she didn't want her work to be fed into the training models. And to me, it seems like the copyright office in the U.S. also has not given copyright to works of art that were so far, I think that they've rejected anything that was generative AI, right? Um. Yeah, what the, so what the Copyright Office has said um, is that if you, if you, if you use an AI system um, and there is uh, less than a minimal amount of human creativity that goes into that uh, creation, they will not register the copyright. Um, and I think, uh, but what they've also said is that there have been a, there have been a number of circumstances where individual vi visual artists have used, uh, I, I believe all, the all these cases involve stable diffusion, which is one of these text to image generators. And um, this hasn't been just like sort of a single prompt where you say, draw a picture of a boat floating on a lake. You might, that might be your first prompt, but then there, it's a very iterative process. And they might say, make the boat a little bit bigger, make the, the, the lake a little bit greener, make the sky a little bit bluer, and go on and on uh, hundreds of times, hundreds of times, some of the prompts being up to hundreds of words in length. Um, a lot of human creativity has gone into that. And what the Copyright Office has said is, nope, sorry, that's not enough. We're still not going to give you a copyright on the output of those systems because it was essentially still the machine, still the AI system kind of doing the creative work um, that, that produced the output. I would say that's, that's very controversial. Um, there, are, there are some who absolutely agree with that. I would say we at the, at the Motion Picture Association have some concerns because it's not that people are you know, putting in a couple prompts and getting out a whole movie, but again, because of those, um, those tools that I use, that I, that I talked about, that um, our studios are using and, and have been using for decades, but are using more and more and are just so integrated into the making of a movie that needs, that 
we don't want to have a situation that because you're using AI tools um, to help produce a movie that, again, had probably thousands of creative people working on it, that, that you don't get copyright protection for the ultimate output. I think we're still at the early stages of seeing sort of how all these matters are going to play out in different factual scenarios. Really, all we've seen so far is these text-to-image generator uh, generation cases, uh, but we're going to start to see more, and I think it's going to be um, there's going to be a lot of tricky scenarios that the copyright office has to has to confront. One well, and I also think though that the Chinese copyright office has been issuing copyrights from generative AI tools, so we're going to have a global difference. In some instances. Chinese and Korean and is uh, Indian and I think a few others. Yeah. For for me, one one uh, distinguishing line there that might help allay some of Ben's concerns is to the extent to which you can predict the output based on the input, right? And it sounds like the tools that you use, the outputs are very much predictable, or at least you hope they are, because you want the zip removed in every frame, right? Um, Compared to a lot of the stable diffusion things, it's, I think, less, far less predictable what the output is going to be based on any, a prompt of any length. Right? Yeah. And I think you can refine it, but it's... Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And, and that is the, the predictability element is something that the Copyright Office has cited, saying, yeah, it's not predictable just to put something into a prompt. Uh, but I'm not sure how well that holds up. Um, so as, as people probably know, it's very easy to get a copyright. If I take a picture on my iPhone... Um, not too much creativity goes into that. I can go and register that and pretty unquestionably get a copyright. Well, you know what? If I have my eyes closed and I kind of wave this around and I'm like randomly pushing the, the button and I, don't, I can't predict like where the thing was actually pointing when I pressed it. Well, you know what? There's still going to be a picture. Even if it's a blurry picture, the copyright office is still going to give me a copyright. Um, so uh, it's interesting. The, the predictability thing... Um, may work in certain scenarios, but I don't think you can consistently say that just because uh, something has been uh, that created without too much predictability that, that you're not deserving of a copyright. Now, I'm going to use an example, which I'm going to immediately take back, but people, people talk about Jackson Pollock, you know, flinging paint at a big canvas. Um, and I, I, not knowing very much about art, thought that was unpredictable. I've since had people tell me, no, 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 he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, but that's the, that's the idea, is that you could, that there are artists who do things that maybe you couldn't predict, and those things have, have traditionally been granted copyright. So not, I'm not confident that that's kind of going to be the, the fair dividing line between what deserves copyright protection and what doesn't. Yeah, fair enough. And there may be other places where those gray areas expand too, right? I mean, you talk about the iPhone... I think every picture you ever take with your iPhone now has some sort of AI processing on the back end that you have no control over, right? Oh. And that just happens. Um, but when, when photographs came into popular use, there was a fight, not a significant fight, but there was a fight as to whether those were copyrighted. Because was it the device that created it or was it the human? So there's, there's a long line of, these, of the disputes and, and how they eventually get worked out. And I agree, they all, they do work themselves out. It is not the end of the world, but um, I'd like to hear from Hoden about what are some of the more existential risks in the space, and how is that going to have an impact on intellectual property? And, because um, you've written about a lot of the, uh, the real existential risks of generative AI. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's interesting because the existential risks I've written about are, will AI take over our minds? Uh, TLDR, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, but um, on the, I actually think that one of the foundational issues that should be solved is actually piracy and, and, and pirated content because there's also just a lot of infringing content point blank period online. And, um, you know, we talk about whether, you know, if an AI system trains on, pirated movies, say. Um, actually, the best way to solve that issue is in an ag AI agnostic way to, and there's lots of things that policymakers and Congress can do to address the piracy uh, part of it. Uh, you know, I know that, uh, you know, 15 years ago or so, it was much easier to uh, watch illegal movies. Not that I know personally, but uh, it was much easier to do that. And, and um, you know, if we are able to solve the, the piracy issue, I think that 
um, that actually goes a long way. So perhaps not existential, but certainly a foundational, a foundational issue. Well, it would then help answer Stan's point with regard to just being um, copyright disclosure only being for economic, for the desire to exploit, to um, get money from the GAI companies. If you've trained on, on infringing content, not, the, not that the content itself, the, but the content is infringing, does that change the, in any way the debate? Sorry, let me, let me try so to rephrase you, your question. If you've trained on infringing content, well, let me give yeah. you this example. So we know that um, the reason why there are uh, Taylor Swift deepfakes is because they trained on Taylor Swift copyrighted images and pornography. Right, so and we're not saying that, I'm not saying that, and probably copyrighted pornography in most instances. But nonetheless, we would say, like, there's, we're trying to, in many ways, try to eliminate that harm. And it's an incredibly difficult question to try to eliminate it. First Amendment problems, um, significant amount of, you know, output, output determinative regulation really does run up against the First Amendment. But nonetheless, if you have disclosure, is that a way in which you can um, potentially help lessen those harms? I, I tend to think disclosure works better for the outputs than the inputs. Um, and I don't know that any of the people in whatever sort of online group that created those images would voluntarily disclose. <laughs> right, there's a, there's a little bit of a bad actor problem here in, in this particular fact fact pattern, right, but, but in, other, in other ones, I still think disclosure works better on the output side than on the input side. I'm, I tend to think model construction is more on the fair use and setting aside some of the examples that, that I think you spoke of, of like if you trained exclusively on one artist's body of work, that feels a little different than if you train on the whole world of content. So, right? But what a tour, by the way, the images that went somewhat viral on Twitter and Created the chain of events on Taylor Swift. They were not. They were not pornographic. They were explicit, but they were not pornographic, thankfully. Um, and and while that was taken care of very fast because she's one of the most powerful women in the world, um, I think the question here uh, actually runs into something interesting that we haven't talked about, which is notice and takedown systems. And um, there's there's many right notice and takedown systems. There's one in the U.S. There's one in the EU. And um, how those are usually used um, as a chilling of speech tools often um, by those who have the money to, to use them. There's whole copyright car cartels of sorts to do that. Um, and then there's a separate question of protecting everyone, including women, uh, from you know, abuse using these tools that have higher scale than just Photoshop. Um, but I don't know if you're right, like if disclosure would do anything in this equation, because no one is gonna, or maybe someone will, but like no one's gonna voluntarily say, I'm the person who did this, come see me, Taylor Swift. Uh, I, also, I also think there's a lot of, especially in this particular instance, there's a lot of um, kind of elements at play. Um, yes, there is a kind of IP related issue in that those are her, you know, whether you talk about publicity rights versus, you know, at its core, you know, talking about revenge porn and, and um, you know, impersonation. And, um, and then there's also this IP, but I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of different policy levers that we could be talking about, uh, you know. And so I think that, yes, we can have this conversation in the, in the IP space, but I actually think that, what, yeah, you know, as Ash said, um, what are the laws that are protecting women? You know, where are their federal revenge porn laws? And perhaps that is one of the first things that we should be considering as opposed to if we said, because of this instance, you know, I, you know should copyright be the, necessarily the policy lever that she should be pulling, you know? I think about what is the most, what is the biggest issue here? How do we solve it in the most comprehensive and, and like, uh, effective way? Well, I think it goes, I, I do think that there are instances in which data beyond copyright, that there are ways in which the generative AI tools are exploiting them and um, certainly don't have any legal rights under copyright to prevent that. But whether there are policy tools 
that go beyond copyright, as you said, about revenge porn as one of the places where that could occur. Also with regard to, at some point, personal data. Right? Does anyone want to talk about any of the use of your own data and the ability to opt out of the use of your own data? And something that the EUAI Act and the EU Data Act suggests may be possible. I'll, I'll talk about use of, of Wikipedia content, although maybe not from the opt-out perspective. We freely license everything under a CC uh, license. We do like to get attribution and share alike. Currently, I think most of the big AI models are not complying with either of those two conditions. Um, and so that's it's a sticking point for us. Um, but we, yeah, we, we want people to use Wikipedia content to sort of enhance the world's knowledge, right? And if, if a large language model can contribute to that, then we, we want that. Um, one thing to flag about the content on English Wikipedia, several other languages, as well as lots of internet content generally, is that it also contains uh, a fair amount of bias, right? Lots, lots and lots of the editor community, especially in English Wikipedia, are people who look like me. And so that, that comes with its own sort of that impacts how those language models will perform over time, right? And so I, I don't know what the right answer is other than we would love to get more editors involved. <laughs> um, we, need, we need more diversity of editors to, to counteract that problem on our own platform. Um, but that's a, that's a thing that is sort of, has fallen out of the conversation in, in the language model context that was always a part of the other sort of algorithmic prediction system conversations, right? And, and I just want to acknowledge that we're, <laughs> we, we're working on fixing this problem, but it's a problem that is also sort of being amalgamated in the large language models. And so that's a, that's a risk that I would like to see, you know, the developers take more, more sort of steps to protect against. I would also maybe push back and say that the, if Europeans have the, the, the right to opt out, it's not from the EU's AI Act, but the GDPR. And so where is the US's federal privacy law? And, and perhaps that's the place where they should, that policymakers should be focusing on. Uh, on the, uh, having worked on a federal privacy law since 1997, <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> I believe was the year I began. Yeah. I, I, let's put it this way. I always win the bet every year when I say, will there be a federal privacy law this year? And I vote, I bet no, and I win every year. So <laughs> I, I wish. And we all lose. And we all lose. I, I think that's fairly true. Um, I do want to open it up to the audience if there's any questions. It's, it's a, we're on a Monday afternoon at, at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And um, does anyone have any questions or, or points of view that we think haven't been expressed? Oh, please. Um, I have a few, but I actually, the one I would start with is for Mr. Adams. And it's just going back to a point you said at the very start, talking about whether Wikipedia or similar uh, older models of information, if you will, are threatened by something like ChatGPT. And you made the comment that no, because ChatGPT doesn't back up its sources. My question is, do you have any research, have you done any study that people care <laughs> uh, that would be a great question for our research team. You know, <laughs> anecdotally, I think there has been a shift to, and perhaps in response to just how much information there is. Yeah, I oh, yeah sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the question was as to whether or not with the growth of generative AI tools that don't provide any sourcing, has that been an, an issue for the people who are using the tools and whether that's having any impact upon Wikipedia. Yeah, so I think we're all sort of inundated with information all the time, right? And, and to some extent, we may have lowered our standards slightly about how much we care about the accuracy of any said piece of information, right? It's like, well, I'm just going to learn a new thing in five minutes. Um, but I think there's always been this sort of divide among different people who are, are like, no, I want to know if that's really true, I want to know where that information came from. These are the people who go to Wikipedia. Not everybody does that, that's fine. Um, but I think it would be a benefit to society if there were some means of signaling in the output, especially to information-based queries, 
sort of how much someone could rely on that as being verifiable. And that's, that's why we push hard for attribution on the output side is for that verifiability piece, right? So you can go back and see, oh yeah, this is like what somebody said on Wikipedia or some other site rather than, no, this is just a thing that, you know, the output made sense because the words fit nicely together and statistically they're likely, right? That's, that's very different than, yeah. is this a piece of knowledge that I just was, was conveyed? So I'm, I'm hopeful that people will still value like verifiable information. Our, the, <laughs> this is an existential problem for us, right? <laughs> if people stop valuing verifiable information, then we're all, we're all in trouble. I just wanted to comment on that. The Stanford Human AI Project has done research and, and around the sourcing question, which is whether or not the answers after the prompts are actually sourced and purporting to be sourced and actually sourced are two entirely different things. So that what they have shown is that, and this was as of last April, the things that were claimed to be sourced, 50% of the content that was output wasn't sourced. So that it is, there is a, an, in many ways, a false impression left that the sources are what they say they are versus Wikipedia, which actually does go through sourcing. We we worked with OpenAI to build a ChatGPT plugin that was exclusively sourced from Wikipedia content, and it was still not as accurate as we would like, right? It's, it's still, it's just prone to putting in the wrong word and then going down an a imaginary rabbit hole. Um, I will also say, I think down the chain people care, because if you, if, when your question made me think of those lawyers who... That's where my okay, brain was yeah. with it, actually, because one of them even asked, is this a real source? Yeah. And ChatGPT said, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> and then you filed it in court. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Iva. I just want to follow up on this question. I do think that there are still potential harms to lack of sources. When it can, and, and I kind of, my question is, who do you think is, should be held accountable? And one example is um, Amazon sold a couple books on foraging that were completely wrong. People would have died had they read these. So just to repeat the question, was there are um, examples now of, for example, Amazon books that have been published that through generative AI tools had recommended um, poisonous mushrooms. Who should be responsible for the publication of that, of that material? So when you ask a platform liability question, I magically appear. Um, <laughs> So the fascinating thing here is uh, with Amazon and the books, it probably would still be in like the Section 230 land, right? Like platforms are not liable for third, third user, third party user content on them. Bookstores are not liable for books sold there um, because that's just kind of how, I mean, I'm not gonna do Section 230 bit here. Uh, what's fascinating here and when it comes to generative AI is that um, Ron Wyden and Chris Cox, who have who were the authors of Section 230, have come out and said, we don't think Section 230 applies to the outputs of AI. Um, some advocates argue that they do, or that we should create a Section 230 for AI-generated content. That hasn't happened. And I am pretty sure as we speak, there are cases making their way through courts um, and we're gonna like figure it out in the common law system because there is no answer when it comes to AI generated content. And a lot of platforms have, uh, you know, ChatGPT, AI plat platforms websites have the disclosure or like, you know, you'll ask them a question about like an allergy you're having and they will write like four paragraphs about how this is not a doctor advice and you should go to a doctor and this is just like general knowledge. Um, trying to get themselves out of this, which I would, as you know, someone with a legal education, highly recommend they do. Um, but, but that hasn't been answered yet. And, and the question here becomes, with the scalability that we have with generative AI, is it possible to hold them accountable? Or if we hold them accountable, are they just gonna chill their own speech and become unusable? And we've already seen this. There's a, 
Georgia defamation case against OpenAI that everyone expected that the court would dismiss at the motion to dismiss level, and the court didn't. The court has, uh, did not grant the motion to dismiss on defamation for outputs. So there is exactly as Ash said, it is going through the courts in the U.S. as to who's, who bears responsibility. And I do think one way to think about that is where is the content generated from? And so for a GAI company that says, we're not going to disclose where our content came from, then there may be an obligation then to, to bear responsibility for the outputs, even with disclaimers. So any other questions? One more. Yeah, I, I don't have the question, especially as, as we're having this IP piece happening, particularly with uh, just voice on AI, so like this, the AI systems are designed that some artists are resorting to, to use images that would eventually destroy AI models to, for example, in the case of you make a prompt that says cat, these AIs are trying to train it to like make an image of a dog. And I think like in particular, like, you think as we were talking about this outputs that might break IPs, like the algorithms that break these models, how can like AI companies to resort to any type of uh, harm or should they be able to advocate that this other voice and AIs are introducing harms and damaging their IPs and their, their uh, AI models? It's an open question. And I, I would say one of the oh, issues, the what the, oh, the, the question was is, um, AI models that um, create destructive that create destructive materials, and and whether or not what the impact is and the implications of that, and I'd say one of the pieces, and and then unfortunately we have to end because the the uh, keynotes are going to begin at three thirty. Uh, in many ways, training data that trains on itself ends up in a mad cow disease problem. The cannibalization problem is real and will um, have impacts on this. And on that positive note. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Could I, could I close I out with something more positive? This, this, this reinforces the importance and the value of human created content. That's absolutely right. But I thank the panelists.